Okay, this is the lecture video for MAC 1114 trigonometry. We're in section 7.1 where we're going to be taking a look at the inverse form of the sine, cosine, and tangent functions. We'll be finding the exact value for each of these inverse functions as well as working with uh, composite functions for each of these functions. We'll have a uh, small introduction to solving equations involving inverse trigonometric functions, although that will be reserved mainly for section 7.3 where we will give a full treatment to solving um, equations and then also again in section 7.4. Okay. So let's begin our conversation uh, regarding inverse with a little review of uh, some of the concepts that we learned in algebra. Take any function, the graph of any function, and this is a function that we've been working with um, quite a bit over the last, uh, in the previous chapter. This is the graph of the sine function. And what I want to bring back to your um, attention is that when you are able to find the inverse of a function, that function has to pass, the graph has to pass both the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. A graph only passes a particular line test when that line passes through the graph once and only once. So this passes the vertical line test, but it fails the horizontal line test. So because this fails, the horizontal line test, it actually does not have a inverse. And therefore, what we do is we restrict it so that we can actually have a conversation about finding um, the inverse for the sine function. So instead of treating the entire sine function, we will be looking at just a portion of it. And specifically, we're going to be looking at the portion from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. We're going to clip out just this portion right here, and that's what you're seeing here. The portion from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and this is where we are going to restrict our domain to. Because by restricting to that portion of the graph, we now can find an inverse, because this now passes the vertical line test as well as the horizontal line test. So the main thing that you're going to need to do is to memorize the restrictions in this section as though they were formulas for both for sine, for inverse sine, inverse cosine, and for inverse tangent. So those restrictions are mentioned down below. There are restrictions on the domain as well as the range. So let's take a look at this. When it's in its inverse form, which is called the explicit form, and then we give it the name implicit form when you take it out of inverse form. And that occurs simply by switching the argument of the inverse. Argument is this expression right after the inverse. If you switch that argument with the term that's by itself, just interchange those two. That's what's happened right here. The inverse symbol is taken away. So without the inverse symbol, it's called the implicit form with the inverse symbol, which is how the problem is going to be originally delivered to you. And right away, you're going to take it to the implicit form to finish the problem. Okay, so what this is, what you're seeing right down below it are the restrictions, same restrictions that were mentioned here, and I can go into more detail here. Uh, when you are given it in its original form, the argument of inverse sine must obey this, these restrictions right here. So the value that you're originally given must be between negative 1 and 1, or else that inverse does not exist. This information regarding pi is where your answer needs to be. So your answer needs to be restricted within this region. You need to be somewhere between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And here's a picture that you may want to memorize for inverse sine. Okay, for inverse sine, because you're going to rotate in order and draw pictures of triangles like you always do. 
uh, when you try to give me your answers for inverse sine. What I am saying right here, these restrictions, what you're seeing right here is that you may all only spin somewhere in either quadrant one or quadrant four, and you may not spin out of that area. Do not come into this area at all. You're restricted to this area when you go to give me your answer. What you're seeing here, where they're telling you that the argument can only be between negative one and one, that is the value that you are originally given in the problem. But this restriction that I have given you a picture for is where you have to stay when you're presenting your answer. Okay, now this value, I mean, you can just press this into the calculator and right away you'll see if you're out of this zone. But, you know, you can also try to memorize it. Okay, so that's what I have stated that restriction three times. Here it is underneath the picture. Here it is stated again, but here I'm giving you a little bit more explanation that the negative one to one is with respect to the argument of the original inverse statement. And then this, infer this restriction here, which I've given you a picture to memorize, I would actually put that on a note card and memorize it. Your answer needs to be somewhere in either quadrant one or quadrant um, four. And this actually needs a little negative. This is positive pi over two, this is negative pi over two. So you can spin in a negative fashion to give me the answer. Just don't come through this area um, as a way to get to your uh, final location when you draw your picture. And you'll see what I mean as I do all the examples. Okay, so let's come to example one. And in example one, it says, this looks like just completing a definition that you've just been given. Um, and it says here, um, y is equal to the inverse of x. What does that mean? And they're trying to get you to rewrite it here. And they have put the restrictions here for you, telling you that x has to be between negative 1 and 1. They're talking about that, the argument of the original inverse statement. And this is where your answer has to be. But when they say this means blank, they're trying to get you to rewrite it. And I was telling you that that just takes switching these two so that you can write it in its uh, non-inverse form. So x would go on one side by itself, right where the y was. This would now be regular sign rather than inverse sign, and the y would take the place of the x. So this is equivalent to this. Okay, that just came from the definition on the previous page right here, where we talked about the uh, explicit form and you writing it in non-inverse form, which is called the inverse, the implicit form. Okay, example two, now we start to work with values involving inverse, and this is where you're going to have to remember those restrictions. First of all, what they're giving you here, that is between negative one and, and um, one. I mean, square root of two, just in case you don't know what it is, just to get a sense of what it is. Two divided by two. See, that's definitely a number between negative one and one. So that just means that this problem is ago. You're going to actually be able to find a value for this problem. If they give you a value that falls outside of the uh, interval negative one to one, you can't even move forward with the problem because it's undefined. So this is only defined if this value right here called the argument is between negative one and one, and it is. Okay, as far as what you're going to give me for an answer, you are not to spin out of this region right here. You can maybe think of this as a banana belly. It's kind of what it looks like. So you can be anywhere from pi over 2 to negative pi over 2 when you go to give me your answer. Okay, so inverses are angles. So you can start off by going like that, stating that you understand that an inverse is an angle. You can take it out of inverse form using what we just uh, talked about here in example one. How do you go from inverse form to non-inverse form? You just switch these two. Put the theta over here next to the sine and square root of two over two. 
That's why we consider this section an introduction to solving uh, trigonometric equations because it's what you're going to be doing in section 7.3 only without the restrictions. <clears throat> so basically what this says is the sine of what angle is square root of 2 over 2. And since you've already come all the way through chapter 6 and continue to work with this concept of reference angle, that should be pretty familiar to you. Okay, let's draw a picture. Make sure that when you draw your picture that you are in a quadrant where the sine value is positive. Okay, you see that you have a positive sine value there. So now consider these two quadrants that you have a choice of. You can either be in quadrant one where everything is positive, or you can be down here when you go to draw the triangle that satisfies this because you're going to try and draw a triangle showing me <clears throat> that you understand what the triangle and the reference angle looks like when the sine of the um, angle is squared to 2 over 2. That's going to be your work. So this would be the quadrant that you're in, quad 1, because you want your sine value to be positive and the sine value, which is y over r, and the r can never be negative, so really this is just about y, and y's are negative down here. You could also be thinking the saying that I taught you, all students take calculus. The sine value is negative down here. So your picture needs to be right here in quad one. You only had a choice of these two quadrants. Okay, so the sine value needs to be square root of two over two. Sine value is always your vertical leg. So you're just saying, what is the reference angle across from square to 2 over 2? Well, that would be 45 degrees. They want you giving these answers basically in radians all the time. And if they want anything other than that, um, they'll state it. Okay, so that's the reference angle. However, after finding the reference angle, your actual final answer will be where has where did you have to rotate to to get your arm to be um, this many degrees up off the x-axis? That's what we call the final theta. However, in quad one and only in quad one is the final theta equal to the reference angle. In every other quad that you could possibly spin into, that isn't the case. The theta, the final theta, and the reference angle are actually different. So in this particular quadrant, what the reference angle is happens to be what the final theta is. Okay, so this will be your final answer. You've stayed within the restricted area. You've given a picture that shows that the sine value is square root of 2 over 2, and then you're noting that you understand what is the reference angle responsible for a sine value of square root of 2 over 2. And that's from section 6.2, and then we just kept using it throughout uh, chapter 6, and we'll continue to use it all the way till the end of the course. Okay, so that answer is um, theta equal to pi over 4. Okay, let's get some negatives in there so you can get even more of an understanding of what's going on here. Okay, again, we start off trying to understand that inverses are angles. Then we go from this inverse form to non-inverse form simply by switching the theta and the negative one-half. So you know your restricted area, once again, is that you can be anywhere in either quad 1 or quad 2 and nowhere else. Now you want your sine value to be negative. That is not possible in quad 1, so this time you need to be in quad 2. Remember, you have to stay in between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 whenever you're dealing with inverse sine. Okay, can't be in quad one because this says your sign of whatever angle you're going to give me for an answer um, should be negative, and there are no negatives there. So we need to be in this quad right here. So once we've settled on the quad we have to be, 
being spent into that quadrant. You can close up by just approaching the nearest x-axis. Go put this value in the sign position. So let's keep reviewing that from chapter six. Your sign position, your sign, the leg that stands for your sign value is always the vertical leg. We also call that the y value. So y's are most definitely negative here. That does stand for your sign value. And then uh, directly across always from your vertical leg is your reference angle. Reference angles are always positive. So always this is, uh, remember that this is the short leg. This would be the one half square to three over two combo, but we're not concerned with this value right here, which would be square to three over two because we only need to know the reference angle right here at the origin. And that reference angle is always across from the vertical leg. So it really doesn't, don't have to think much about that. But you are in a triangle where one leg's one half, this happens to be negative, and the other leg is square to three over two. This is also known to us as the short leg. And always across from the short leg is the 30 degree angle. 30 degrees is the same thing as pi over six. Okay, so now this will give you a chance to understand that unless you're in quadrant one with your answer in this problem, because they always start you off with the easiest ones, you were in quad one. So the theta was the same thing as the reference angle inside the triangle. That is not the case in this problem. Okay, it's slightly different, and sometimes the numbers are completely different. Okay, so when you go to give your final theta, you have to state how did you spin to this arm right here, which is really just an extension of the hypotenuse, where would you have to spin and in what direction to get from the x-axis where zero is? How would you get from here to here? Well, first of all, you'd have to spin negatively. You'd have to rotate down this way because remember, you're not allowed to leave this zone right here. So you may not... To get to where I am right now, you may not spin this way because then you're coming out of the restricted zone. So your spinning has to take place um, staying right in here as you spin. So if I wanted to get from zero down to this arm right here, I would just spin negatively, and this is how much I spun, 30 degrees. So in the end, final answer here, negative pi over 6. I'll keep repeating that the only time your reference angle and your final theta are going to match is when your drawing is in quadrant one. Okay, moving to example four, inverse sine of zero degrees. So again, let's start off with the same steps. Inverses are angles. Take it out of inverse form by switching the argument, the value in the argument position with the theta. So just be theta here and zero here. So you want to know when, when is the sine um, value zero. And when you're talking zeros and ones, you're just you're at a, a location called a quadrantal angle. You can't really draw a triangle. You're on one of the axes when you're dealing with zeros and ones. Okay, so again, remember that um, you can only be somewhere in here. That picture is still drawn right above. It can be somewhere right in here. And you want to be at a place where the sine value, which is really the y value, remember how sine is defined as y over r, but r is just 1, so it's really just y. Okay, so if you were on the unit circle right here, but you know that you can only stay somewhere in this region, you need to be able to find your answer in that region. So let's talk about um, the values at um, each of the axes. If you're on the positive x-axis, and this is a unit circle, you're one unit out, that's your x-coordinate, and you're zero units up in the air. This is called the zero degree location. If you're up at pi over two, then the coordinates are um, zero for x, and then you're one up in the air. OK, 
Hey, if you're right here at the negative pi location, because the, this is the only place you can be. You can either be up at the top at pi over 2. You can be down here at negative pi over 2. Coordinates would then be 0, negative 1. You'd be 0 for your x, negative 1 down. So in which of these spots do you get a sine value? Remember, the front value is the cosine. The x value always represents the cosine. Back value represents the sine, and that's because cosine is defined as x over r with r just being 1, so it's really just x. The sine value is defined as y over r with r being 1, so sine is really just y. You wanted to know at what location, at what angular location, is the sine value 0, and that would be right here at 0 degrees. So the theta here for your answer is staying right at zero degrees will get you a sine value of zero just like you wanted. So this is your final answer. You, have not le you haven't le left the restricted zone, so you're good with that. That couldn't have been an answer, pi over two, because the sine value was one. And again, x value is cosine y value is sine. So that didn't satisfy. This particular location down at negative pi over 2 also didn't satisfy because the sine value was negative 1. So the only place that satisfied was at 0 degrees you have a sine value of 0. So this section very much has to do with you being able to read what are you being asked for. You're trying to go to a location, an angular location, where the sine value is zero. That's how you read that equation to yourself. Okay, example five. I believe this one is an issue. Uh, let's go right back to what the restrictions were that were stated several times on the first page, but they're still right up here at the top of the page. When it's in this inverse form, that argument has to be a value between negative one and one. Note that in the example that I'm doing right now, that is not the case. This is too big. And your calculator will even tell you that because you could put this in your calculator. As it says, use your calculator to find the value of the following expression. Give your answer in radians, rounding to the hundredths place. Say undefined if the value does not exist. And in fact, this does not exist because the argument is too big. So inverse sine. Go ahead, put that 2 in there. Boom. See how it quits? Therefore, this is undefined. Okay, moving to example 6. Use your calculator. Uh, give your answer in radians. Round it to the hundredths place. Now, I wanted to make a comment about this. That when you're doing inverses, the mode... Um, it has to be according to what they want your answer to be in. So if they say give your answer in radians, that means your mode should be in radians. Okay, so make sure that it's in the proper mode if you're going to use your calculator now. Let me check mine real quick. Uh, mode. Oops. Radians, but you would that would still be undefined there. So radians, second quit. See, even if you were to press it in now, so inverse sine, and you could put two in there, and it quits on you. That was the last problem. Then this one is inverse sine. We're putting in 0 0.8, close that up, and we get 0.93 if we round to the hundredths place. Okay, let's still think about some things here just to make sure we're always paying attention to what the restrictions are. Um, notice that this answer that you're giving is in the restricted zone. 0.93 is most definitely in this restricted zone because this is the restricted area for inverse sine. Up here is pi over 2. Pi over 2 is 3. 1,4-ish divided by 2, which is approximately 1.57. And negative pi over 2 is just its negative equivalent. 
And when you say the answer is 0.93, then you're in this first quadrant somewhere. So you're fine with that. Okay, so that's the answer for the theta that is equal to inverse sine. You're giving angles. So your calculator has just found you an angle, but in radian form. Okay, and then we come to what's called the composite functions. And this is one function substituted into another function. We're working with, again, the inverse sine function and the regular sine function. So this, these composite functions can be given to you in two ways. You can either have the inverse, fun, inverse sine function as your outer function, and in that case, this argument right here needs to be in between negative power 2 to power 2 for this to be doable. And if that's the case, if it's in this restricted zone, you will have no work to do. This inverse will cancel with the sine, and that argument will be your answer, as long as the value, the argument, is somewhere between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Otherwise, you're going to have to rewrite it. You can rewrite these in, um, when the inverse is the outer function. However, these cannot be rewritten. If they don't give you a value that's somewhere between negative 1 and 1, this is going to be undefined, therefore you'll never get a chance to apply the outer function. So it'll just stop dead in its tracks. But these can be rewritten so that they are in the restricted zone. And I'll demonstrate that in some of the examples that follow. Okay, so here we go. You have to be looking to see whether you've been given this scenario with uh, inverse on the as the outer function or have you been given this because that will determine which set of restrictions you need to look at. I'm being given inverse um, sine function on the outside, so I'm looking at this right here. I need to make sure that this is in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. It really is because here's where pi over 2 is. And this just says x is in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay, so where is pi, uh, pi over 4? 1 fourth pi is just half of that. So if you've rotated to right here, you most definitely are in between um, these two. So you're okay. So as long as the uh, argument that they're giving you in this comp um, composite function is in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, then it's just a simple canceling. And the value that this simplifies to, this composite function, is just whatever is the argument value is. So that's your answer there. However, this one, we got a little situation here because this is not between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. And you can tell because, once again, these values are one point, approximately 1.57 and negative 1.57. However, this is beyond that. 9 times pi divided by 8. Look where you're at there. That's 3.5, and that is not in here. So when the uh, outer function, for co and I think I wrote this here, I typed it for you, for a composite function, with the outer function being the inverse, which is what you have here, the angle in the argument can be re redrawn so that it satisfies the restriction. So let's see what this looks like to begin with. If I went to 9 pi over 8, notice how I would fall outside of the restricted zone. I would no longer be in here because here's where 9 eighths is. Well, first of all, this is 1 pi, which is 8 eighths. So you would have gone past that 1 eighth. So this reference angle right here would be 1 eighth beyond the 8 eighths mark. So you'd be down here in this quadrant, most definitely not in the restricted zone. But what you can do is you can redraw this situation so that you have the same reference angle And 
so that the sine value is the same as it is here. When you're in this quadrant right here, the sine value, understanding that the sine value is the y value, it's defined like this, but r is 1, so it's really just y. So sine value, y values down here, they're negative. You also want to mimic that. You want to be in a quadrant, stay in the restricted zone, but be in a quadrant where sine values are negative and where you have the same reference angle. So let's make that happen, okay? We can be here anywhere in quadrants one or two <clears throat> in order to abide by the restrictions. <coughs> Okay, so I want sine value to be negative. Definitely can't be up here. I have to be down here. Want that reference angle to be the same, so I want a pi over 8 reference angle. Try to remember that the reference angle is not necessarily your final answer. It will be if you're in quadrant 1, because in quadrant 1, the reference angle is equal to the theta. When, when you give theta, though, what you're giving as an answer is this. How far do you have to rotate from zero to theta? And you have to also state in what direction do you rotate. So if you're trying to stay in this zone right here, you know you're not allowed to spin counterclockwise because you're not allowed to be in quadrants two or three when you're doing an inverse sine problem. So the only way you can get from zero to um, where this arm is right here is if you spin negatively. And how much are you spinning? Well, you're spinning whatever this angle is. So in the end, your answer is negative pi over eight. Okay, and what happened in that problem is that I just rewrote I just mimicked the restrictions for that problem. So if you wanted to rewrite this problem, <coughs> it's just inverse sine. And instead of doing sine of 9 eighths, I was doing sine of negative pi over 8. Okay, so sometimes you'll have to rewrite them if, if this falls outside of the restricted zone for composite functions. Okay, example 5. This time you're presented with another composite function, only this time you have regular sine on the outside and inverse sine on the inside. These cannot be rewritten, and I've written a note to you uh, to that effect. In this case, the inverse is immediately undefined, and you can press that in for inverse sine or cosine. You have to have a value between negative 1 and 1, and you can just once again check that out. See, right away, that's undefined. So if this number is undefined, you can't take the sine of it. So we just simply say that there is no answer for this. Don't give me the Don't say that the answer is zero. Don't say there's no answer. Show that you know what it means to have no answer. It is undefined with respect to the restrictions. And you can just say undefined. Okay, when we move to example 10... <clears throat> and we're going to take a look at uh, inverse cosine now. So inverse cosine, same story. If you look at the entire cosine function, there is no inverse because it fails the horizontal line test, and therefore, once again, we've clipped out a certain portion, and this time the portion that you're seeing that's been clipped out of this picture is from 0 to pi. <clears throat> and now once you have only that portion to concentrate on, you can find the inverse cosine because it now passes the vertical as line test as well as the horizontal line test. 
which are the type of functions that actually have inverses. Okay, so the restrictions are stated here that you're going to stay between 0 and pi when you give your answer. It's stated again down here, so we have a different picture this time. This picture looks like a sunrise. You can be anywhere from 0 to pi for your answer. As far as the value originally given as the argument for your inverse statement, again, just like inverse sine, it needs to be between negative 1 and 1. That's the value that they originally present you with as the argument of the inverse. Okay, so when you spin around to create your triangles and figure out what your um, solution angle is, your answer has to be somewhere in either quad 1 or quad 2, and that's the restrictions for inverse cosine. Sometimes these restrictions are just more easily memorized by memorizing the picture because your calculator can always get you out of, hey, what are the suitable values, um, what values are suitable for the original inverse. You can just plug it into your calculator and you'll know right then and there whether the problem is going to shut down because it's undefined. Okay, so here I've just said it again another way. Um, just the argument, that's this needs to be between negative 1 and 1. Your answer, which is an angle, must obey the range restrictions for inverse cosine, which is between 0 and pi. Okay, here's some examples that go with it. Again, we'll start off these just like we start the inverse sine problems, not the composite ones, just the singular ones. We're looking for an angle. We're going to take it out of inverse form by just writing cosine rather than inverse cosine, switch these two, and then you'll be in non-inverse non form. And so we want to know for what angle is the cosine value one half? So kind of, again, like an introduction to solving trigonometric equations. When we throw you into full-on solving trigonometric equations, then you'll be using all kinds of algebra, factoring, foiling, all different kinds of things, square root method. But right now, just a kind of like soft introduction to solving trig equations. Okay, so let's remind ourselves right away about the inverse restrictions. I'm going to be throwing that picture down, making sure you're going to stay in there. Now, I want my cosine value to be negative. Remember, cosine is defined as x over r. But since we're dealing with unit circles where the r is 1, it's really just the x. x's can't be, posit can't be ne um, negative over here. They're positive here. They're negative over here. So that kind of tells you which quadrant. It doesn't kind of tell you. It tells you exactly what quadrant to go into. If you want your x values, which is what cosine is, to be positive, you have to be in this quadrant right here. So once you've decided what quadrant you're going to build your triangle in, then you might want to have nice little clean X and Y um, bars. Draw your triangle. This is your rotating arm right here. It's ultimately going to be our theta. But that theta is based off of this reference angle. So go put um, the 1 half where your cosine values belong. Sine values um, represent the vertical leg. Cosine values being the X. They represent the horizontal leg on the triangle. Okay, so if this is one half, remember the vertical leg is always the one that gives you the reference angle. So if this is one half, the partner that goes with it in a 30, 60, 90 triangle is square root of 3 over 2. Always across from the square root of 3 over 2 is the 60 degree angle, also known as pi over 3. Okay, so if my reference angle is pi over 3, so is my, fate, my actual final theta, and that is only true in quad 1, that your reference angle will actually be equal to your final answer.
only in quad one. <clears throat> if you're in any other quad with your spinning, with your hypotenuse, then you have to think a little bit harder. And that comes into play whenever we're asking you for the inverse value of something negative, like this problem. In example 11, you're being asked for the inverse cosine of negative square root of 3 over 2. Okay, once again, you are restricted to quad 1 or quad 2 any time you're doing inverse cosine. I would just keep drawing it until you memorize it. You can either be here or here. Okay, so when we understand that we're looking for an angle, if we rewrite this, it's cosine of what angle is equal to square root of 3 over 2. For what angle can you have a cosine value of negative square root of 3 over 2? Well, first of all, having a negative cosine value, that can't happen in quadrant 1. It has to be over here. So we are going to spin out of quadrant 1 and into quadrant 2. We're over here somewhere. This spinning arm is always your hypotenuse, and it is always the final theta that you are going to give for your answer. However, you can make a triangle out of it by simply approaching the nearest x-axis, which would be this negative x-axis, and closing up that triangle, then placing this value on the appropriate leg. The cosine value is always the horizontal leg. And the vertical leg, its partner in a 30, 60, 90, would have to then be one half. It is this vertical leg that tells you what the reference angle is. So the reference angle would have to be um, 30 degrees or pi over 6. Okay, they've mentioned pi here. They want those angles in pi form. So remember, you are trying to give the theta that's associated with this reference angle. For theta, I'm going to keep repeating this, that you are being asked when you give your final theta, how far would you have to spin from zero, from zero degrees, which is right over here, and you're allowed to spin anywhere in this area. Okay, so when you go to give your final theta, this is really what you're answering. How far would I have to spin and in what direction, signifying negative or positive, to get to this arm right here? Because that is the final answer. Let me move this over just a bit. Get myself a little bit more room. Okay, so where you'd have to spin to get to here if there's one six underneath you and knowing that the one pi location is six sixes. So if you're trying to spin to get to where this arm is, this hypotenuse, an extension of the hypotenuse, you're at five sixes. Because one additional six would have gotten you to six sixes. So your final theta, the theta, associated with a cosine value of negative square root of 3 over 2 is 5 sixes. <clears throat> okay, moving to example 12. So we did two singular inverse cosine problems. Now we have composite functions, just like we had for inverse sine. And you have the same sort of restrictions here. Um, one set of restrictions for when inverse cosine is on the outside. These are the ones that can be redrawn or rewritten. Whereas the ones with regular cosine on the outside cannot be rewritten. If this is not an appropriate value, if it's undefined, that shuts down the problem right then and there. Whereas here, if there's a val if they give you a value that's out of the restricted zone, you can still redraw it and continue with the problem. And you saw me do that <clears throat> uh, for one of the problems when I was doing inverse sine. Okay, so find the exact value. If this is in the restricted zone, and the restrictions for these composite cosine problems are inverse cosine on the outside, 
the argument right here has to be somewhere between 0 and pi. And if it is, then this just cancels with this, and the argument value is your actual answer. So <clears throat> is 7 pi over 9, because we're in this situation, for example, 12, is that between um, 0 and pi? Well, it is, because 9 ninths, 9 ninths of a pi would be 1 pi. So 7 um, pi over 9 comes before that. So that is this value that you're being given here is in between 0 and pi. Therefore, there is no work in those situations. And the answer is just 7 pi over 9. Okay, then for example 13, <clears throat> Find the exact value, if any, of the following composite function. Do not use a calculator. Again, we find ourselves with the inverse function on the outside, regular cosine function on the inside. So again, we're making sure that the x value that they are giving us is in between 0 and pi. However, this is not. Because you're not allowed to be any bigger than pi. Well, 5 fifths would have been pi. This is way beyond that. So this is a situation where you can redraw it, rewrite it. Okay, let's take a look here at where 9 fifths is. Again, this is 5 fifths right here at 1 pi. 9 fifths would be, and this would be 10 fifths. Let's mark these landmarks right here, 1 pi and 2 pi, but in terms of fifths. So 9 fifths would be all the way over here. And this would be this uh, reference angle if you are at 9 fifths. That means you're 1 fifth of a pi before you got to 10 fifths. That's where this rotation is, all the way right here. But to get to 9 fifths, if you're spinning to positive 9 fifths, you're going all throughout this uh, zone that you're not allowed to be in. You're supposed to only be spinning somewhere between um, quad 1 and quad 2. Okay, you can only allowed to be between 0 and pi when the inverse cosine is on the outside. So we need to be somewhere in there, but mimicking situations that are occurring at theta equal to 9 pi over 5. For instance, here's some things that are happening here. With respect um, to the cosine, the cosine is positive over here. Cosine is your x value. It's even defined as x over r, or just x since r is 1. So cosine values are positive over here, and you have a reference angle. If you're at 9 fifths, the space or the angle in between 9 fifths and 10 fifths is pi over 5, which is your reference angle. So you want to mimic those situations, but in quad 1 or 2, wherever you think you're going to be able to go so that you have positive uh, cosine values. Okay, that means we have to be in quad 1. So let's readjust this picture. We want this to be occurring, so that means we got to be here rather than here because we only have these two quadrants to pick from according to these restrictions right here. You have to be between 0 and pi. So we're going to be right here. We're going to make sure that our reference angle is pi over 5. And then the final theta that goes with this, because we're in quadrant 1, that final theta matches the reference angle, pi over 5. Okay, so that is your final answer. Okay, moving on to example 14. This time we have regular cosine on the outside. Those are the ones that cannot be rewritten. I've already written here that your argument, which let's go over these again, regular 
cosine on the outside, that argument must be between negative 1 and 1. Okay, this is not between negative 1 and 1. So right away, this is an undefined value, and you can't take the cosine of an undefined value. So this whole thing is undefined. Okay, moving to example 15. Find the exact value, if any, of the following composite function. Do not use a calculator. So we have... Um, not use a okay. okay, so we have inverse cosine of two fifths, regular cosine on the outside. So we're in that situation right here. Where as long as this value is in this restricted zone, it has to be something between negative one and one. I think we're in luck for this problem because two divided by five is just 0.4. That's definitely between negative one and one. So we're okay here. And you don't have to put it in decimal form, just thought you could relate to that a little bit better. We're okay with this argument value. It is between negative 1 and 1. And in that case, if it's right where it needs to be, this, these two functions cancel. And the value given for the argument is your answer. And you can give it in fraction or decimal form just because that is an exact decimal. It's not one of those ones that runs on and on, but I'm going to give it in fraction form. Okay, moving on to example 16. Examples that involve tangent. Okay, so again, starting you off with the picture, this is the full tangent graph, and we're going to restrict it to just one of those waves so that we're passing, so that we're not failing the horizontal line test. If we tried to say we could find the inverse of this entire function without restricting it, it would restricting the graph we would fail the horizontal line test and there wouldn't be an inverse but if we just take out one of the ways specifically we're going to be concentrating on this negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 and just using that wave right there so um, I want to make a little distinction here this restriction is very similar to the sign here's the restrictions again right here is just that there's no equal signs on those endpoints. So while it still looks like the banana belly, you can give anything from here to here. You just can't give these endpoints of pi over 2 or negative pi over 2 as your answers, but you can give anything in between. Um, when you're doing uh, inverse tangent, there is no restriction on the argument. It can be anything. However, your answer, which is always what this is about over here and what I am drawing these pictures for, to help you remember where your answer should be. But the value that they originally give you, no restriction. Okay, the argument of the inverse is not restricted. I wrote that for you. Your, your answer, an angle, once again, just trying to confirm in your mind that inverses or angles must obey this restriction between 0 and pi over 2. No equal signs. This is just a picture of this statement. Okay, in example 16, we now look for um, the exact value. This is just a singular inverse statement rather than a composite. So we say that it is equal to some unknown angle. All inverses are angles. Take it out of inverse form, and it will just be switching these two. So we're just looking for the location where the tan value is 0. At what angle do we have a tan value of 0? Again, these zeros and, and 1s um, very much to do with those quadrantal positions. Okay, just first of all, you should right away draw a little picture of your restrictions just to remind you that you better stay in here while you spin to wherever you're going to give me as your location, your angular location for an answer. Okay, so let's see. If we are trying to get a value of zero and we're on this unit circle, 
this location right here at zero degrees, because that's definitely in the restricted zone, has a x coordinate of one and a y coordinate of zero. Would the tan value be zero there? Because it can't be up here and it can't be down here and nothing in these quadrants when you're in a special right triangle are you going to get a tan value of zero. You can't, you don't get that for 30, 60, 90 right triangle nor do you get it for 45. So it has to be at this location because it can't be up here, it can't be, that's not allowed to give you're not allowed to give those as an answer. So you can see that tan, which is y over x, would be 0 over 1. Yep, that's perfect. You do get a 0 at the 0 degree location. So theta is 0. When you give the answer 0, you can just give 0 because that, an that particular answer is universal. It's given as 0 when it's 0 degrees. It's given as 0 when it's 0 radians. Okay, moving to... Um, example 17. What is the inverse tangent of negative 1? Okay, so this is some angle that we seek to find. We want to know the tangent of what angle is equal to negative 1, and maybe you have that one firmly entrenched in your mind. Again, we're restricted to this. You have to be in either quadrant 1 or quadrant 2, you know you're not getting any negatives in quad one, so you have to be down here in quad two in order for any kind of negatives to happen. You're looking to get a tan value of um, negative one. So if you recall, the triangle, one of the triangles that you've worked with repeatedly is the one that has square root of two over two as your sine or y value and it also has square root of 2 over 2 as your x value, and that one would be positive. Because you're in a quadrant, you're over here in a quadrant, this triangle's in a quadrant where x's are positive but y's are negative, and this horizontal leg always represents your x value, or what we call the cosine. This represents y value, or what we call the sine. But anyway, when you do to the tangent, you do y over x, and that would give you a negative 1. But we want to give the angle associated with it. So we know that the reference angle inside the triangle is 45 degrees. However, the question, whenever you're not in quadrant one with, your, with the drawing of the triangle that you're creating, the um, final answer is where is this on? Where do you have to rotate? How far do you have to rotate from zero to get to that arm. That is the final answer that you are giving. Okay, you'd have to rotate 45 degrees, pi over four to get here, but you'd have to do it in a negative, using a negative rotation so that you don't spin out of the restricted zone. So theta is negative pi over four. Okay. Example 18, find the exact value, if any, of the following composite function. Do not use a calculator. So we've done composite functions for sine, composite functions for um, inverse cosine, and now we're doing them for tan and inverse tan. So once again, you have some restrictions, different restrictions based on which is the outer function. When inverse tan is on the outside, the argument that's given here has to be in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. These ones with the inverses on the outside can be withdrawn, be redrawn, rewritten in case they don't give you um, a value that's in between here and here, but these cannot be redrawn when you have regular tan on the outside. So I'm working, and when you're working with regular tan on the outside, then that argument can be anything. And when it is right where it has to be, in the original problem you're given, then you don't have much work to do. It's just this cancels with this. But sometimes uh, there's extra work to do because maybe it's not a value in the zone that it needs to be in. So we're doing this case, inverse tan on the outside. That argument needs to be between pi over 2 and uh, ne negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Remember that this is approximately 1.57, 3.14 divided by 2. 
and this is negative 1.5. So I'm just a quick way of judging whether this is in the right zone or not. So this is 6 times pi over um, 7, and you might already have a sense that that is not in the restricted zone. 6 times pi divided by 7. Look how big that is. 2.7 is definitely beyond 1.57. So you may be able to uh, finish this problem just by redrawing it. So we can go like this. We can figure out where 6 sevenths is. This is 1 pi. It's these 1 pi and 2 pi locations that allow you to tell where to spin to, which would be written as 7 sevenths. So if you're rotating to 6 sevenths, you're rotating to 6 sevenths, that would make this reference angle right here 1 seventh. So in order to continue with this problem, you rotated to 6 sevenths, and the minute you rotated there, you were out of this restricted zone for this particular setup of comp, uh, composite function on tan. So I want to go somewhere where my reference angle is pi over 7. I want to mimic that key feature. Over in this quadrant, we're talking about tans. Remember, tan is made up of your y and your x value. Over here, you're in a quadrant where y values are positive and x's are negative. y's are positive, x's are negative. That means that your overall tan value being made out of y and y divided by x would be negative. Mimic these qualities, but stay in the restricted zone for this particular com composite function. Okay, so where are we restricted to? Well, it has it right here. We're restricted to either here or here, but we can't be either of those endpoints. Well, you know, you're trying to satisfy these things right here. You want your tan to be negative, and in quad one, nothing's negative. So you have to be down here. You want your reference angle to be pi over 7. So I'll put that right in there. And in the end game, you're supposed to be giving the answer to where would you have to rotate from zero to get here, indicating the direction that you have to rotate in so that you don't leave this restricted zone from pi over 2 to negative pi over 2. You don't want to leave that zone. Therefore, to get from zero degrees to where this arm is right here, you would have to spin in a negative direction, and this is how much. This is the angle that you would spin through, pi over 7. So final answer is theta is equal to negative pi over 7. Okay, that completes section 7.1.